I have one core job, and that's to keep people focused on the greater mission. He kept saying billion. I'm like, do you mean million? He's like, no, no, like I'm going to be a billionaire. You have the opportunity. You got to believe in yourself. You got to believe in your vision. And listen, if you have things stacked up against you, that is the number one asset that you can have in business. And that, my friend, why he's a billion dollar man. Welcome to the Behind the Rise podcast hosted by the Perino Brothers. My name is Angelo and I'm joined by my brothers and business partners, Lucho and Valentino. On this show, we will speak to successful local, national and global entrepreneurs as well as discuss lessons we've learned in our 15 year career building a nine figure organization. We're in the middle of our journey now and want to share with you all the wins, losses and lessons learned behind the rise. So we are on the road today in beautiful Miami up in the penthouse suite with my brother Zane Jan here. Uh, Zane is the CEO of Better Earth, one of the fastest growing solar companies in the United States, founded in 2019. Just for some reference, in 2022, they had $149 million in revenue. In this year, in 2023, they're projected to be at about $400 million this year in revenue. Fucking Zane, crazy. Thank you for inviting us into your beautiful home. Of course, I'm excited to be on the podcast. I, I, I heard that I'm going to be the first behind the rise on the road. So this is true. I'm excited to set first, a trend. This is true. Rodeo. This is I mean, and, and if we're going to be on the road, it, it's got to be like this. I mean, look at this. View. Yeah, 100 percent. This is ridiculous. We couldn't not be out here. So, yeah, just I'm a quick, quick note. I don't know if you heard the number uh, in when he started. So 2019, he started in what is that? Four years later, doing 400 million in sales. Yeah. That, in, in, in July, we reached four years. Yeah, that to me is insane. You're talking about speed of implementation, how fast you grew. That's the most shocking part of that number to me. Yeah, and speed of implementation is something that you preach all the time. We, you know, we know that we work with you uh, in a few different capacities, and that's something that you always preach. And you know, we'll get into that. So, Zane, one of the first things we want to start with was we want to get an idea of like, you know, where you grew up, how you grew up. You know, I knew you grew up in the Boston area. Yeah. You know, a little bit about your upbringing, how you were in high school, kind of things like that. Yeah, so I grew up, uh, I came here when I was six months old. Both of my parents didn't speak any English, and we lived in Bulrica, Massachusetts, in the basement of my uncle's house. So that was my start. That was the first five to six years of our life. Um, it was probably like a 400 square foot basement. Mm. Um, super, super cold down there. There wasn't good heating. Uh, there was one bed and me, my, my mom, my dad all slept in that one bed. So that was how I grew up. That was like kind of my, my beginnings here. Now at that time, obviously I was super young, so I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't know that that was bad. I thought that that was completely normal. Um, so I was used to it. But as I started to get older, when we turned like five, six, uh, my parents decided to move. We moved to a small town called Weymouth, Massachusetts, uh, about 15 to 20 minutes outside of Boston. And we moved into almost like a projects building. Uh, rent was super cheap. It was government assisted. Uh, it was literally probably seven, 800 square feet max. And uh, it was two bedrooms. So I got my own bedroom for the first time. I was the only child. So that was huge for me. If I had any brothers or sisters, we'd all be basically staying in one room. So I got lucky with that. And uh, one of the things I always tell people when I'm telling them my story is, uh, you know, if you look at this amazing view here and you look at the ocean and stuff, my first view ever was looking outside of my window and seeing another brick building. Like that was my first view ever. So like you literally open the window and like 10 feet away from you is another brick building. And that's like all you see. So when I was there, I always knew I wanted to get out of that situation. Probably around like seven or eight years old, I got smart enough to know like, okay, we're poor. This isn't a great situation. Uh, we live in a town that I would say is probably, you know, lower middle class. And we are, you know, probably the bottom, you know, 1% of that town. So at this point, uh, my parents never, ever, especially when I was younger, never made over 15 or 20 grand a year. Um, that was like the absolute max. And when you're making that type of money, even though like rent was assisted and food was assisted, we still had, you know, so many other expenses. And it was really check to check for my parents at all points. So my dad was a taxi driver and he did other hustles. He first started in a hotel. He was a bellboy uh, bell at the Park Plaza Hotel in Boston. That was his first job. And then he became a, I think it was city cab or something like that. Uh, he became a driver for them. 
and uh, he just started riding taxis all day. My mom, she did a bunch of jobs where she would work back room layaway at like Marshalls and stuff um, because she couldn't really speak great English. So what she did was she started to learn English, started to get better at that. Um, and then luckily she got a job being like a, uh, a clerical worker at a elementary school. So she would just help with, you know, copy machine, um, you know, printing out stuff, walking kids to the bathroom, kind of stuff like that. So that was kind of, I guess you could say, like the beginnings of everything. Uh, but one of the biggest problems that I always had was I was not disciplined at all. So I would uh, go to school. I would never, ever do my homework. I wouldn't even bring my books back from school, I think, most of the time. Um, I would leave my homework there. I just literally could not care about doing my homework. And I would try to skip school. I would try to not go. And even when I did go, I didn't listen to my teacher. So I vividly remember when I was in second or third grade, they basically thought that I had a learning disability. They were like, dude, you're, 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 you're dumb. You're not smart. You're not going to be able to figure it out. Um, we need to put you through a test to see you might have ADD, ADHD, or one of the, you know, one of those things that they label kids with. So they had me take a test and I took this test and I was reading and doing math at a seventh or eighth grade level in second to third grade. So they were like, holy crap, like you actually have it in you. And I'm honestly so lucky that they did that test because I didn't believe in myself at that point um, because they told me I was dumb. They told me I was stupid. They told me I couldn't figure it out. And when I did that and realized, like, oh, I'm actually smart. I just don't like to do this. It gave me actually a boost of confidence. Uh, it didn't help me do more homework. It was more just like of a fuck you. Like, I am smart. I just don't want to do this. Right, right. Um, so I didn't hate school. I, I mean, I hated school. I didn't want to go. Uh, and as I got older, um, I, you know, I just resented it. I resented showing up. I resented getting it done. Now, I come from an immigrant family. So for them, it's like we came to this country specifically for you to go to school. Like, if you don't go to school, we've failed at life. That was the entire premises right. of why they moved to the States. So um, I got that. Every time I got back at home, my parents freaking out. You're going to be a bum. This is going to happen. Why don't you study? All of this stuff. As I started to get older, um, I remember being in school. And I was probably in, like, the sixth grade. Um, and I got, first got introduced to weed. Like, I was, I was in the sixth grade. And I had someone, I, I remember his name is Preston. I got handed a joint uh, and he was like, smoke this thing, this is awesome and whatnot. Smoked my first joint at that point and I was like, I wanna do this, I really like this. So I did that from like sixth to seventh grade. Seventh grade, I got the idea in my head of, I'm gonna sell weed now, you know? Um, so I picked up my first ever weed uh, kind of sale, which was a huge quantity. I stole money. Uh, out of my dad's pocket, like in hopes to repay him, because he always, you know, he was a taxi driver, so he'd have, he'd always come home with like a stack of cash, and he'd put it in his uh, in his pocket, so he'd hang up his jeans in the bathroom. So I would steal the money, and uh, I would take that. He I, he was gonna notice at the end of the week. I knew I had to flip it. I had to put the money back wow. for him not to notice. So I went. I went to Quincy, Massachusetts. I went on an MBTA bus. Um, a kid I knew, he, uh, he had almost like a little trap house going and he sold me my first ounce of, I think it was mids at the time, you know, some of the worst weed. But at that time I was like, I didn't know. Yeah. I put it in my backpack. Uh, I remember like stopping to go to the bathroom in a pizza hut and like a cop in there, like eating lunch, looking at me, I'm freaking out. I'm sweating. I get out of there. I go back on the bus, head back home. Um, and I sell my first zip of weed. And that was kind of like how, I guess you could say my first entrepreneurial kind of journey. Wow. Zip. A, I haven't heard the word a, zip in a long time. Zippy. <laughs> yeah. That's there's how you know lot. I did it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you flipped the zip. There's yeah. a lot of those stories. Though. What, two commonalities that, that I noticed. One, a lot of entrepreneurs that we talked to hated school. Yeah. And when they hated school, they didn't put any of their attention and they kind of like were a C student throughout kind of their school. Number two, not a 100% commonality, but always was like an interest of like fast, something like that. Like whether it's selling weed or like bookie shit yeah, or something like that. A fuck you attitude. Like, exactly. Yeah. Like you a fuck you. to somebody, but you don't even know why. Yeah. Right. And the, you know, the pressure from, you know, being a first generation immigrant. Right? Yep, exactly. A about going to school and, and, and that. Not to mention I'm a first generation immigrant Muslim whose parents pray five times a day. So I never realized if that. I get caught with weed, it's like I'm fucking going to hell. Like they're going to cut my dick off. Like right. that's, that's, that's the Actuality. type of mentality they have. Right. So, um, I do that stuff. I get a little bit older. Then I start. I remember, dude, they had this one drug come out 
when I was in like eighth grade, uh, Salvia. Oh, yeah. Fucking, I remember Salvia. Yeah, yeah. Sketchy, sketchy stuff. Got so high. Yeah, it's so like a fast. plant. I yeah. literally think you could like <laughs> buy it at Home Depot, smoke this plant. Um, so anyways, I'd be doing all these drugs. I got into drugs and I was like, okay, I'm going to become a full-blown drug dealer. Then by the time you know it, I'm in ninth grade. I'm in high school. Again, no passion for school, no passion for being successful. And I just start selling drugs. And I'm probably making 500 to 1,000 bucks a week. Um, so I'm making, you know, at my high point, like four grand a month. And being in high school, coming from no money and making four grand a month, and my parents never ever touching four grand a month, I start buying stuff because that's the only way I can buy stuff. I can't afford a bike. I can't afford the uh, Jordan shoes that everyone's wearing. I can't afford the Jordan backpack that, that, that everyone's wearing. So I have to go out there and I have to buy my own stuff because my mom would go. She'd go to like thrift store type places, buy me old Gap clothes and old Navy clothes. And I'm like rocking that. And I'm going to school and I'm getting made fun of. So I'm like, I don't want this anymore. I want to I wanna look good. So I, uh, I started buying my own stuff and, ma and making my own money. I think ninth grade, the first time my parents ever caught like drugs on me in a backpack. I was pretty good at hiding it, but I got too cocky and got caught up in it. Um, they freaked out. Uh, again, like for, for Muslim people, the church is a mosque. So they took me to the mosque and they had me talk to the imam, which is the priest. And like they roasted me, right? They're like, we're going to put you in jail. There's like this program we have. It's in Brockton, Massachusetts. And I like got scared. But I remember at that point, I was like, you know what? I got I to gotta figure out how to do this. Uh, I don't care about the repercussions. I'm going to keep going because I know for me, it's a survival mentality. If I'm not making money, there's no way I'm getting out of this. School is not going to be my option because I'm rolling with a 2.0 GPA the entire time. And I just don't want to do this thing. Like I, I hate it with a passion. So I, uh, I did that um, around 10th grade, maybe 11th grade, uh, I find uh, a network marketing company. Now, network marketing is starting to become big with young people. It's always been known for, you know, a 40-year-old mom who wants to go and, you know, sell juices or makeup, but it was never for kids. So this company, I'm sure you guys remember, Vima comes out. And energy drinks. Yeah, energy drinks, Verve, and it starts popping off the block. Like, you see 18 years old with Benzes, you see people selling stuff, and I'm like, I'm going to do this thing. So I keep on selling drugs, I get into this Vima thing, and my parents at this point are driving a beat up like 1995 red Oldsmobile. Um, and uh, this car is just like a piece of trash. Like I don't want to get dropped off at school. I don't want any of my friends to see me. So I, uh, I go and I start selling this thing. And three months into it, they give me a Mercedes Benz. So now I'm driving no way. a Benz C class at 16 years old, like a boss going to school and, you know, rocking all my, you know, nice clothes, just trying to be a hustler. And that kind of became my mentality. But that was the first time I ever got exposed to business and sales. I was like, okay, I can take this product, I can recruit people, I can sell this product to them, and the more of this product I get in this company, you would get points. And the more points that I get, the more money I'm gonna make. So I start making money with this company, um, I do pretty good, and then when I'm like 17 to 18, somewhere in that range, the FTC comes in and they shut that thing down. So now my income goes away from that. Um, one part I forgot in my story that was actually really critical was when I was 16 years old while all this was going on, uh, one day I got a phone call in school and I'll never ever forget the moment. I used to always get called down to the principal's office, right? So it was normal for me. But even every time I got called down, there was always a drop in my stomach because I always knew I'm getting in trouble. I've had, you know, many suspensions, almost uh, expulsions, uh, you know, in-house suspensions, out-of-house uh, suspensions and whatnot. So I get called down and I'm like, okay, what did I do this time? You know, I, at this point, I've been caught for so many things. I've been caught with drugs at school. Um, I've been caught with, uh, with stealing at school. I stole from a teacher's class. Um, he had like memorabilia I stole. Um, and it just, it was stuff that at the time, you know, whatever. I thought I was a gangster, but I'm not proud of looking back. So all this happened, so it was normal for me to get called down. So I get called down and the assistant of the principal looks at me, she's sitting at a desk. And again, I never ever forget it, it's like yesterday. And she has a different look on her face. Usually it's like, what did you do this time? This time it's like her jaws dropped. She almost looks like she's going to cry. And I'm like, what happened? And she's like, you got to talk to your dad. So she, I put on the thing with my with uh, the uh, phone and she goes, your mom just had a stroke. Um, she's wow. in the hospital. Uh, we don't know how bad it is. We think she's going to be fine. 
boom, hang up the phone. I get to leave school. I go back home and I'm just waiting. And no one calls me. Uh, my dad can't call me. He's not answering his phone. My, uh, my aunt, my uncle, like no one's answering. Uh, so for five hours, I sat down, I cried, I prayed. I was like, listen, God, I'm gonna stop selling drugs. I'm gonna stop doing the wrong things. Just save my mom. And uh, again, I'm completely in the dark and how bad this is. Then I got a call from my aunt and she basically tells me what happened. She goes, your mom was you know, at her school. Um, she fell to the ground during lunch completely, like hit her head on the floor, fell. They brought her to the South Shore Hospital, which was around us in Weymouth. And then they airlifted her from there to Mass General Hospital. Oh, so I'm like, holy shit, they airlifted her? Like I know when they airlifted her, it's extremely bad. And they go, yeah, she's unconscious and she's not awake. So that leads into, I'll just give you like the short of that story, um, a two year recovery process for my mom, 95% chance of, of mortality and a 5% wow. chance of survival. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, so I do that um, and it was really tough on me because again, I love my mom. And I asked the doctor, like, what happened? My mom doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke. She's extremely religious and she's in shape. Doesn't make sense that my mom just had a stroke. What happened to her? And they go, uh, it's most likely, it's, number one, it was a brain hemorrhage. She had a blood clot in her head the size of an orange. That's why there was a 5% survival chance. There was like no blood flow going. They need to do emergency surgery. And I said, what's the reason? And they go, it has to be just stress. And I'm like, what could wow. you be stressed about? Two things, me and money. Like, those are the only two things. And I was like, that's my fault, right? So I remember going at Mass General into the hospital, punching the, the glass in the bathroom, like breaking it, like extremely pissed off, like not knowing why this happened to me. Um, and my mom was in a coma for an extremely long time. I think it was like, you know, almost a year where she's not even like wow. awake. They take out half of her skull. They put it in a fridge, cause, uh, in, in, in a freezer, because that's, that's how they keep the skull from not like going bad and they have to do surgery. So when I see my mom the next time on her bed, half of her head is indented in because oh part God. of the skull's not there. So we do that. It's really tough for me. They eventually do surgery to put the skull back in. She's rocking a helmet for the remainder of the time after that. Uh, and then she wakes up. And the hardest thing for me is when she waked up, she recognized my dad, my aunt, but not me. And that crushed me. Wow. Because she didn't know who I was. She was like scared of me. And she knew who my dad was. She knew who my aunt was uh, in that room. So, man, I just broke down, started crying, praying to every God, praying to everything, just like, please change this situation. And I just went on, you know, WebMD and all these articles and trying to see how we could revive her and get her back to normal. And that led to another year to two process of just recovery, like me teaching her to speak English again, me teaching her to walk again, me teaching her to drive again. Um, luckily, she got back to about 95% of where she was at. So she got good. She's normal now. She's completely fine now. Um, but it was one of the scariest moments of my life. So when I was 18, the reason that was a big deal for me is I had no plans to go to college. I wasn't going to get into college. And I wrote an essay on my SAT and to the college about my mom's situation and the stroke that happened. And I wrote my whole life story about selling drugs and everything I did and why I deserved to get into college. So I got into University of Rhode Island, which I think at average was like a 3.3 or 3.4 GPA. Yeah, that was a tough school to get in. With a, yeah. a 2.0 GPA. Um, wow. I get in and what do I do? I go back to my bad habits. Um, I do coke every single weekend. Uh, I'm partying every day. I'm doing Xanax at night. I smoke weed. Um, I'm just not doing the right habits. I'm not doing the right things. And I feel like shit. But I, thought, I think it's normal because everyone around me is doing drugs. I'm, I'm an extreme person. So if I see some people smoking weed here and there, I'm going to smoke every day. If I see people doing coke once a month, I'm going to do coke every single week. If I see people doing Xanax here and there, I want to do it more and more. If I see people drinking, I want to get blacked out. So I start promoting like bars and stuff. Um, you know, they, they like didn't really have clubs around where I was in Rhode Island, but they had like bars where all the college kids would go. So I start promoting that, start making, you know, a few grand every single month. I start doing some real estate transactions on the side, got my real estate license and just doing those transactions um, and hustling and still making money. Right. I'm making good money compared to everyone around me. I'm like considered a rich kid when it comes to everyone around me just because I hustled my way through it. So. At that point, I'm 18 turning 19 and I get introduced to the solar industry. And the solar industry is absolutely wild for me. It's, uh, it's an industry, I see a kid who tells me he makes 20 grand in a single month, he knocks doors and he sells residential solar. So I go, I don't care who it is, I don't care what you do, I can figure this out. 
I want to get into it. So I stay in college. I go to sell solar. My first day ever selling solar, I know nothing about it. So I put on a full suit. I go door to door in Massachusetts in a farm area. And I start knocking farms like in the mud with chickens running around, cows out there wearing a suit was selling door-to-door solar to farm owners. Wow. And that's like my first... <laughs> Full suit guy, entry. huh? Yeah, sweating I've never seen you wear a suit. suit in my life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're literally wearing a suit. So after a few days, I quickly realized, like, okay, the suit thing, I don't need to do this. It doesn't make any sense. If anything, it intimidates the people I'm working with. And we're selling residential systems to farm owners. What happens is... Um, you know, you know how, how uh, solar works for you guys, but like we'll kind of tell it to the audience. People are essentially you're going in, you're giving them solar with financing at zero at zero dollars down. They're not paying anything out of pocket. They're getting a reduced electricity bill every month. So I'm like, this is a no brainer pitch. I can give them the equipment. They don't have to pay anything for it up front. They're getting a lower monthly payment than what they're paying right now. I'm like, this is a great deal. So we start going and these farms have huge electric bills and they're still residential solar meters, which is rare. So we're selling 30, 40, 50 kilowatt systems, like massive systems. I ended up getting a few hundred grand in pending commissions in my first three months. Wow. And then I get hit with this thing where the state of Massachusetts at the time puts a cap on the solar that you could sell. They limit it to, I think it was like 11.4 kilowatts. Every system I had put was above that cap. So all of my projects get DQ that I'm working wow. on for three months wow. um, and I make no commission there. And now I owe money back to the company because they were giving me a draw. So I quickly get recruited to work at Solar City, which was Elon Musk's cousin company. Uh, Lyndon Rive is his name. And that becomes like my next transition in door to door, selling regular south facing residential homes because it was very rare for us. Like today we can sell most types of roofs. At that time, they're very particular. Like you need a back south facing roof with a ton of sun exposure to get approved. So I start doing that. And that's where I get my first $10,000 a month, $20,000 a month, and $30,000 a month. Um, what, what year is that? Oh, man, I'm really bad with years, but I think that was 2016. Got it. Yeah. So uh, 2016, I'm doing that, and uh, I'm like, I want to get, I want to, I want to do this, but you know, I want to build a huge team. So I start recruiting all of my friends into solar, getting them to drop out of school. At this point, I drop out of college, right, because I'm making so much money, and I'm like. I don't care what my parents think. I don't care about this. I'm making so much money that they can shut up. They hated me for it, but I was like, I'm going to do this thing. I believe in myself. I end up building one of their biggest teams. This is a company installing 15,000 solar systems a month. They're the biggest by far. They're bigger than any solar company today, actually, at that time. Wow. Um, and I build great relationships. I meet amazing people. Uh, my boss at that time was a guy named Hayes Barnard. Uh, today, he's the founder. I'll explain his story in a bit. He's the founder of a company called Good Leap. He's oh, worth wow. like uh, oh, three or four shit. billion dollars. His company got valued at $12 billion. That was the last round he raised at. And uh, he was my boss at the time. So I learned a lot from people like him and different people at the industry. And I get a call one day from a guy and he goes, Zane, I want to work with you. Um, I've heard about what you've done. You've been very successful. Um, I've built a huge solar company. I've sold my piece of it. And now I want to go to California from Massachusetts. He actually lived in New Hampshire at the time, but did business in Massachusetts. I want to go to California. I think it's going to be a great market. So I go to quit because I'm like, whatever, man, I'm all in. He's like, I'll make you head of sales. You'll crush it. Um, and I'm going to give you my, you know, a little piece of equity in this company. I'm like, I'm all in. I'm going to do it. So I leave that year. I was on pace to recruit enough people to make over half a million dollars. And the year after, most likely over a million dollars in just overrides running the entire company's sales force because I had moved so fast up in the company. I risk all of that. I leave that somewhat secured, built up thing and potentially, you know, I'm going to maybe get lawsuits because I'm a W-2 employee there um, to go start this thing and move to California, a state that I had never, ever been to in my life. So that's where my, my real business career started. I moved to California. I drive cross country in my car. Still had the bends from the from the energy drink company. <laughs> Pack awesome. up all of my stuff in that car. I go with two other people that I want to bring with me, and we go to to build this solar company. Um, I go there, and the first month in business, right? I'm just a young, naive salesperson. We start selling. We start making money. I'm like, the California market's awesome. Um, and the guy who is the chief revenue officer of the company gets caught you know, with like an embezzling money type thing, gets in a really bad deal with the owners and gets fired out of the company. 
So now they're like, we have no other person that could lead our sales force. Zane, you're now chief revenue officer. And I'm like, I'm 19, 20 years old at this point. Holy shit. I'm extremely young. I've never, ever done this before. And I have to now go and lead an entire sales force. So we build that company up. We're doing really well. Um, we're getting a lot of sales. I think at our peak, we're doing like 25 million a year. So like we're, we're pretty successful. We're making money at that time. There's not many solar companies even doing what we're doing. And then what happens is I start getting in an argument with my partners. Um, I want to scale. I want to go national. I want to get big. I want to be a billion dollar company. And they do not want to build the process or the company or the structure or the comp plans to be able to even do that. They want me to just stay here, focus on my thing, build in California and keep our company going and just focus on profit. Were they doing sales and installs or just sales? Yeah, we were doing everything. Um, because the guy was a big installer before, so he actually had done that. He was you know, an installer for over a decade, so he had so much experience. We weren't doing the actual day of install stuff. We were just subcontracting out the installs. What happened is we didn't get a lot of margin from that. The company was doing a lot of revenue, but we were putting it all back into the business, and they wanted to turn it into a profitable company. So what do they do? Instead of making the business more efficient, instead of you know, investing in the teams to, to, to make our business um, um, a more lean business that was more profitable, they just had the model of, we're gonna pay salespeople horribly, we're gonna charge customers the most premium rate with low tier technology. So you have the worst product, you have the worst compensation plan and the highest price point to the customer all at the same time. So um, that keeps happening year over year. I'm there for like three years. And uh, then about year three in, I have salespeople that wanna leave. They're like, Zane, we're loyal to you, but we're not getting paid. The market's literally paying us four times more the commission than you are paying me right now. So that means if the market was paying four grand a deal, you're paying me a thousand a deal. And you're generating your own leads. You're knocking your own doors. We didn't do any lead generation back then. Um, so that happens to me. So long story short, I get in this thing with them. I try to convince them to change the model. They won't change it. We go back and forth. And one day I go, you know what? I'm going to hang up the skates. I'm going to move on. And I'm going to go just do my own thing without these restrictions. And I have the toughest conversation in my life with the owner of that company. Um, we actually were going for an investor meeting in Vegas. And I couldn't say no to him because we had set up this meeting. So what I did was I hopped on a plane with him. I sat right next to him the entire plane ride. We arrive in Vegas from California. We sit down at the airport for lunch, and then I tell him that I'm leaving. Wow. Right before the investor meeting. And how old is this guy? <laughs> wow. He was probably mid-40s. So wow. you're like 20. Yeah. Telling this guy mid-40s to go fuck himself. As Correct. Exactly. exactly. And he's like, could I give you half the company? Could I give you most of my equity? Like, what could I do really? to keep you to stay? And as soon as he said that, I was like, I'm out even more because I was like, he knows that he's been screwing me, that I've been doing most of this and I got to move on. So he almost like pretty much starts like crying at that point, right? He's like, what's going on? We cancel the investor meeting and I have the most awkward ride of my life back to California with him. Wow, he canceled that on meeting? A plane. Yeah, we had to like at that point, right? Like he knows I'm the biggest asset at the company. Like Holy shit. He can't, he can't take that meeting at that point. He's not even in the right headspace. Right. Then the next day, I, I actually sleep at his house in an extra oh bedroom. Oh, my God. Kind of waited till after the so fucking trip, awkward. buddy. So <laughs> awkward. Why don't you fuck his wife, too? We, <laughs> uh, we wake up the next day, and he goes from, like, sad and grief, like, okay, do you really want to do this, to, like, defense mode. Fuck you. Like, yeah, I'm going to sue you if you do this. Like, what if we do this? What if we do that? And I was just completely out. Like, there was nothing he could say that would turn me back. That turned into legal lawsuit threatenings. You know, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to do that to you. You know, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, I leave that company. That company goes down 80% in sales the first month uh, that I leave. And we start Better Earth Solar. Wow. Um, Better Earth Solar is the current company. Uh, Better Earth Solar does more sales in our first month in business that that company had ever done in a month in three and a half years. Wow. Um, we get so much momentum on. I feel like I have, you know everyone away from me, every crutch behind me. Um, and we're a sales organization. For, so we're selling for one of the largest installers in the nation. And I get a call from an installer who's like, hey, Zane, um, I was a subcontractor at the last company for your guys' installs. I know who you are and I know your vision. I'm willing to sell my company to you. I'm like, listen, we don't have the money to buy your company right now, um, but I want to make a deal. So we go through and I basically make a fully stock purchase with zero cash up front 
with a company that is four years old, has over a million dollars in assets just sitting there and has real revenue and is profitable. It's making over a million dollars a year net. Wow. And I purchased this company with a small portion of our equity. Um, and at the time, right, like any private equity guy, any bank would tell that guy, you're a freaking idiot. You're stupid. You're going to a brand new company that has like no revenues and no profitability. And you're pretty much for pennies on the dollar, giving them your entire company. That says a lot about that's your, vision. your vision, yeah. you know, your ability to sell your vision yeah. and have everybody believe in it. That that's what that. That's what that was. Correct, but like again, on paper, it makes no freaking right, sense. Right, exactly. The only logical a thing. Yeah. There's, it, that's it, right? But he believed in me. Now, looking back, that guy had the best deal in the world, right? Like he's 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 he has a massive chunk of equity in a massive company, and uh, he gets to he gets to live with that, right? It was a great opportunity for him. The reason we did it wasn't just to get that company. I always knew I could do it. It was to buy a year of time. I knew buying time was my biggest asset. We didn't have enough time and I needed to go to market extremely quickly and crush it. And I just had this chip on my shoulder. I had these rumblings of legal lawsuits coming at me and I'm like, the only way I'm gonna succeed is by getting bigger and getting big extremely fast. Year one in business, we start the business end of July, August. So we really only have you know four or five months in business. Um, I forget the exact revenue number, but it's, it's somewhere in the three to $4 million range. It's not, it's not anything crazy. Um, year two, we do, I think it was 60, no, sorry. That was year zero to one. One to two, I think was like 28 or $30 million. Year three, uh, uh, year two to three was $66 million in revenue going from essentially year three to almost year four was over $149 million in revenue. Wow. And that wasn't even like a full calendar year. And this year we'll do over $400 million. We have over 600 W2 employees. Uh, we have a few thousand sales agents that sell through us. Uh, this month we had 70 different companies that's, that, that sold through us. That's dealers, almost like franchises um, that are selling through us. And we're moving at lightning speed rate. You know, we're working on financing. We're working on the software side of the business. We're fully vertically integrated. And at this point, um, our goal is to become the number one residential solar installer and not just do the install portion, but be fully vertically integrated and provide a seamless experience so that there is no sales company, there's no sales agent, or there's no customer that has a better setup than us. And that's really what the focus has been. Wow, I mean, yeah, that's a when, when you were saying the three things that that company did, when, like the, one of the reasons that you left, right? Yep. They cut their comp plan. They had shitty panels, like shitty product. Yep. And what was the other thing? And, uh, uh, they, they they had shitty comp plan. They had shitty product, and uh, they weren't they weren't very dialed in, and they weren't very focused on providing like a good experience. Right. So those three things are literally the like opposite of what you've been building your company. Correct. On. Those are the things that he talks about all the time. You yep. preach yep. the best comp plan, the best product, the best service, the best experience. Yep. So you literally took what you learned there, all the things that made you hate that company in order to leave and take that big risk, and did the exact opposite to build and your own company. And implemented fast. That's the most impressive thing. Like. When I hear people talk the way you're talking, like the speed of how fast you grow, the first thing I think is like, that's an unhealthy level, speed of growth. Which is what but, everyone's going to tell but you, right? If you, if you zoom into what you're doing, that's, it's, that's it's unhealthy not true growth. At all. You can't afford that. That's going to put you out of business. You guys are going to sink. Everyone we talk to is like, you guys have an ego. You're moving too fast. And the biggest thing I'll say is I'll never forget our first year in business. There was a point where we're doing so much volume and we're and we're moving really fast but the money is coming in the account and it's going out of the account. It's coming in the right. account, it's going out of the account. There was one period, man, where I think we had, it was like the account got down to like $900. And you're talking about our payroll at this point is in the millions of dollars a range per wow. year, uh, six figures a month. And you get to a point where that account gets that low. But the biggest thing I always had was I can have a great poker face. Doesn't matter how bad the situation is. Doesn't matter if shit's hitting the fan. My team will never ever know. My close executives will, but my team will never ever know. And I had to do that like for my team. And we pushed through that. It worked massively. Like we got in a much better position. Then we got slammed with COVID. The entire world is freaking out. The first day of COVID lockdown in California, 
Uh, that was where all our volume was at the time. I go into emergency response mode and I get every single salesperson and employee on a Zoom call and I just go, no one knows what's happening in the world. No one knows what's going on, but we're gonna attack this and we're gonna come out bigger. And our whole business was door to door at the time. Right. That completely got shut down. Right. So now I take all, it was a, it was a few hundred sales agents. I take all of them and I go, we're gonna take every lead we've ever talked to, every deal that's ever, ever canceled, people that have never gone through the full process with us, and we are gonna call those individuals and we're gonna get them going. Like we're gonna make sure that they get solar because they need this more than ever. And the first month we had a huge dip in sales. The next month we had our biggest month ever after that point. Wow. That's when I took all of our cash. We put it back into Facebook and YouTube. Um, I bought tons of age data. I took all of our previous leads and customers. And I said, every single door to door person, I want you to hop on the phone and you're all going to sell these customers. And extremely quickly, we had never sold a virtual deal before. All of our deals were virtual. Wow. Wow. So like now it's like you hear like virtual sales, it's like almost like not commonplace, but it's more common. But at the Correct. time, you got to remember. No one like was doing no it. No one was doing Especially it. Especially solar, right? You're not buying a software product. You're not buying right. some internet thing. You're buying a thirty dollars to $40,000 system that's going on in your house. Right. People are scared to make that decision um, um, you know, over the phone or over a Zoom call. They want to touch it. They want to feel it. They want to talk to you. They want to actually know that you're real. So no one had ever done virtual sales at this point in the industry. So we were pioneering something truly and we did it. And again, it led to our best months, but the really like the first year and a half of the company was extreme adversity, like excruciating pain, extremely scared at all times, paranoid about what's going on. But keeping that mentality of just like that poker face, that leadership mentality of I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to be negative, and no one will ever know what we're going through except us. Is what kept everyone believing, and kept everyone selling, and kept everyone motivating. Yeah. Most of the times when owners go through that type of difficult stuff, they end up folding their entire team sees, and they lose the vision, and their team ends up quitting. I knew my number one asset at that point was my team, yep. so I had to stay on it. Yeah. No, you can see that. I mean, it's and and you did. You did come up bigger and, and better and more innovative now. And did. How, how did you get like partners along the way? Were you looking at places where you were weak and kind of pick pointing those? Were you looking back at your older relationships or like how did the new partnerships align as you were growing? Yeah. So all of my partners worked for me at some point. Got it. Um, they all were under my sales team, under my leadership. They knew who I was. Now I'm the largest shareholder by far at the company, but I knew if I wanted to build something big, right? I couldn't be stingy about it. I had to be very open and I had to give people an opportunity because I wasn't, listen, if I was trying to build a 10, 20, $30 million company, I'm not going to necessarily go out there handing everyone equity, right? Like I'm going to keep my share, but always from day one, the vision was billion dollar company. And I knew the only way I'm going to get there is by sharing this with people and getting people bought in into the same thing I did. So I looked around, I found a genius marketer, I found a genius uh, a, a salesperson, found a genius ops person, I found a genius finance, legal, and strategy person that were on my team. I gave them all equity. I told them the game plan. I told them exactly what we were going to do, and it was head down from there. Today, every single one of them is still at the company. They take massive ownership and responsibility, hold huge positions at our company, and it was the best decision I ever made looking back. When I started, again, Everyone told me, Zane, you're wrong for splitting the pie with so many people. You're wrong for sharing it. There's too many cooks at the kitchen table. But I always knew and I believed in those individuals enough, and we ended up making it work. Zane, did you have a mentor? Like, it sounds like you, you're moving like, in, in such a place of experience. Like, you've done all these things before. And I, I haven't heard of any mentors yet. Yeah, it's tough, man. Um, I've never, I believe in mentors. I think every person should have a mentor of some sorts. But Early on, no one believed in me, and I lived in a place where there was no one successful. Like, the most successful guy that I knew growing up is a guy that, like, it has his own plumbing business and has two, you know, has two, two employees, is maybe cutting six figures a year, and he's, like, the number one top G dog in the area, right? Everyone else, I'm like, oh, if you're successful, you, like, work for a union. You're, like, the electrical union or the pipe fitters union. Like, those are the people that I grew up around that were successful. That was the epitome of success. So growing up, I had literally no one that was an example or no one that I could look up to. So the only examples I had were YouTube. 
like seeing what other people had because listen keep in mind until 19 years old i've never seen an exotic car i've never seen a mansion i've never seen nice stuff so i don't even know what's possible but when i moved to california i started seeing more of that stuff i get inspired and i'm like i want to find the people that actually are doing this and have done this before. So I start reading books. I just become obsessed with books. I become obsessed with YouTube videos. I become obsessed with conferences and I just start studying and studying and studying. But there was never ever someone that I could just call up and go to and say, hey, I'm running through this problem. What do you think I should do? It was always me having a problem, researching and studying the best in their industry or the person that had solved that problem the best and then taking from what they did and implementing that in my business. You know, Jack Welch, very, very famous business leader, um, an individual, there's a principle he has where he basically says, every year you need to cut the bottom 10% of your company. Yep. When I was having a trouble with my team and the quality of my players, I went and I studied Jack Welch and I studied every single one of his philosophies and his principles and I just literally implemented what he did. So I have to say, all my success was not just created by intuition. It was created by problem coming up, going through the struggle, and then just researching the hell out of it, believing in that person who's talking about it in this book or this video, and then implementing extremely quickly. I remember when we started becoming friends, probably like eight years ago, he was talking like, Bill, he was like, yeah, I'm going to have a billion dollar company. And for me, you know, I was just a closed minded. I had my own little company, right? Like making four, 300,000 myself. He kept saying billion. I'm like, do you mean million? <laughs> he's like, no, no, like I'm gonna be a billionaire. And he's like, and he was saying like, by the time I'm 30, I'm like, dude, I, I didn't never said it to you, but naturally in my mind, I'm like, what the Impossible. fuck are you saying? <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I'm thinking that you don't know the understanding of what a billion means. But then he just truly believed in his soul, like truly. Right. He's like, I'm gonna be a billionaire by I'm 30. Period. That's why you got story, all these no people bought in. I mean, that's yeah. why your team has built up so much over time. I mean, you're the definition of a CEO, setting the vision and getting the buy-in with clear, clear, clear vision. Yeah. I think, I mean, and it belief. sounds like that's, vision been, a, that's been a huge key. Conviction, dude, like real belief. Yeah, and like you need that, right? Like your team is just going to be a reflecting image of who you are as a leader. So what they're gonna say when they're working with their customers, what they're gonna say when they're working with other employees is exactly what you're gonna do. Like whenever I go into a store, a company, I'll, all I have to do is look at the employees of the company and very, very quickly I can tell you what that owner's personality is gonna be like. Mm. Just the way that the company moves and the company operates and the way that the people are. So I knew in a business, I learned this very early on, when people look at a billion dollar company or they look at like the government of the United States or the president of the United States, they don't think of people, what they're thinking of is like a machine. They're like, this is like some huge moving machine that we can't even fathom. But very early on, what I realized was all a huge government is, all a huge company is, is a big group of people. All they did yep. was they figured out how to scale people. So I said, if I can be the best version of myself and I can lead by example and make my people better, that's how I'm gonna become a billion dollar company. I'm like, I know if I have thousands of employees that all have the same vision, are all focused and are all motivated by what we do and believe in the vision, that's the only way we build a billion dollar company. And when I realized that, I was like, obviously I need a good product, that's a given. You can't have a shit product and expect to build. You gotta start with having an amazing product, but if you have a good product and you have good customer experience and then you just put the right people behind it, you're, you're going to scale. There's there's no way that, that that you can be stopped. And I just believed in that. I've never seen you waver, too, at any adversity. Like you mentioned through COVID, you know, there's challenges in front of you and stuff like that. I feel like that's where a lot of people will have a vision. Then they'll run into turbulence and right away they're taking a hard right turn. You know what I mean? And I feel like you just you had your eye on the target and you're just fucking plowing through and, and you're going to get there regardless. Yeah. And I, I just think like every entrepreneur needs that. If you don't have that mentality, if you are not willing to eat you know, glass, if you are not willing to jump on nails, there's no way you're ever gonna make it. It takes thick skin, it takes extremely thick skin. Until this day, every day, there's crises that happen in my business that no one knows about, and they never will know about because I will always keep that to the chest because again, I think the best skill set an entrepreneur can have is holding that poker face and going through the waves because what i've always found and listen like knock on wood i've i've been successful and haven't had to have you know any major problems that actually happened in my life but i had a bunch of 
like near death business experiences that happened. And every single time I played it off, just like things were going perfectly and they always seem to figure its way out. And it all goes back to the principle of a business is just a group of people. So if they feel like everything is good, if they feel like everything is moving in the right direction, the business is going to make it happen. And then eventually I just learned as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, the ads start stock, the, the odds start stacking up in your direction and those failures just get a little bit smaller. You know, that thing that felt like a huge blowout punch that was going to knock you out now starts to become a little bit of a pinch. And now my life is a lot less of, you know, huge punches in my face. It's just a lot of little pinches. But when I started, it was like, dude, every shot I had to duck because it felt like a huge punch in the face. What about, uh, yeah, that's a first off great, great point. But what about delegation? So like when you were growing, right? I was just going to bring that up. Because the speed of it, like especially doing installs and sales, the delegation piece must have been extremely hard for you and important. Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So delegation in any business is key. Uh, me and my team joke around about it. Uh, sometimes I delegate too fast, but it's all about speed. Like you talk about the growth we had. It'd be impossible if I was doing everything. You know, I can't go out there and sell the job. I can't do the permitting. I can't do the engineering and design and then install it myself and get it activated. That would literally be impossible. So what I had to do extremely quickly was be a talent scout and find the best people. I needed to find the best people. How do you find people? What if, like, where, uh, where do great players go? Great players don't go to an average company. If you want A players, they want to go where they feel like there's going to be an opportunity and there's going to be something that's in it for them. They need something in it for them. They're not just here for your vision. You can't just be you know, a selfish executive. They're here for their own benefit and you have to show them the roadmap and what's available. And at that time, finding good talent, listen, I got to pay people three, four, 500 grand a year. And when we're just getting started, we can't afford to be handing out way too many of those salaries. So we got to make sure we keep it tight. So the only thing other than salary that's going to get them to my company is vision. And I had to do a lot of those deals where I was like, listen, I know you're going to be taking a 40 to 50% pay cut. I know you're at a company that's five times bigger than us right now, but I promise you this is going to be worth it. How much do you think that social media is important to build authority to get those AA figures to jump? Because they find the A players, they're not on Indeed. They're not like coming knocking at your door. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like how important do you think it is to have social authority to then pull or poach to get a couple of A players? To yeah, come in? A players don't look for jobs. A players get recruited. Exactly. That's right? the like, key. Like a, an A player is never going to be on monster.com or indeed.com or zip recruiter. Like they just don't play there. An A player is never going to be searching for a job. An A player will always have a job. And if they want to leave a company, very, very quickly word will get around and they'll have 50 people recruiting them. So those are the people I'm always going for. Listen, we have a huge recruiting team. We recruit a lot of amazing talent and different people. But when, you, when you're first starting, you don't have the ability to afford Bs, Cs, and Ds, right? You only can have A players. Listen, when you have a company with 600 employees, if six, seven, 10, 20, 30 people are, are C players, you can get by with that, right? They're not going to kill the entire six, seven hundred, a thousand people, right? But when you have a company of 15 people and just two of them are C players, those two people can get into those other 13 people's ears and destroy the morale and the culture of that company. So at the beginning, we were obsessed with who we brought on and our standards were extremely high and we did not let anyone slip through the cracks. But as we got bigger and bigger and bigger, obviously that's going to happen. I can't control all 600 employees. I can't make all of them perfect. But one thing I can do is make sure that we have a process on scale that's built to seek out any of the bad points of, of a future potential hire. Some are going to sneak into the company, but as soon as we see it, we need to address it very quickly and we need to move forward. And I always tell my team, let's take that 10% a year Jack Weld strategy and let's move that to 10% a month if we can. Now, there's never ever 10% of the people that we can cut every single month. There's just not that many bad players or people that we can even afford to cut at that point. Um, but we're always very ruthless with it because listen, at the end of the day in business, it's about surviving. Like you have to survive. And if you start to put, you know, I see two types of business owners. Uh, some of them just have huge hearts and someone can take advantage of them. Someone can be horrible at, you know, at their job. Someone can do all the wrong things and they just don't have the heart to fire them because 
you know, they're just a nice guy or gal, right? Like they just don't feel like getting rid of that person. Then you have other business owners that have zero empathy, don't really understand what the problem is and just fire people if the job doesn't get done. We like like a perfect balance there. We want to understand our employee. We want to understand their struggles because sometimes you might be a C player in engineering, but you're going to be an A player in, uh, you know, in scheduling or in customer service. So we do our best to be able to like cater to those people and put them in the right position. But what does that require? It requires knowing your people and being very close to them. So what we, we basically take the approach of is we're going to help you. We're going to support you. We're going to put you in the best position but if you don't step up, we're gonna let you go. We're not scared to do that. And we've gotten to a point where our retention rate is unbelievable with our employees. We have you know, little to no attrition. And I would say you know, eight out of 10 people that leave the company leave because it's the company's decision and not the person's decision. That's a hard thing to deal with that scale too. <laughs> like keeping, uh, you know, only keeping A players on, cutting out the yeah. bottom feeders, and really Culture. knowing and knowing your employees. I gotta, I gotta. We're kind of, we're kind of dealing with that now. Like now that we have so many employees, we're getting a little more distant from certain level people. That it's like, you know, we're, it, it can be scary at times that some shitty people are getting like, creeping into yeah. the company, and we're gonna lose control of it. I got a, I got a question in that vein. So, you know, selfishly, right? Like if you're, if you're starting like a, a, a company right now, and you know, you want to get A players in the beginning. If somebody is putting in the a, an A player effort, but they're getting like C player results, right? It doesn't exist. It doesn't? It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as A player effort and C level results. There is such thing as someone showing that they're putting in A player effort or telling you that they're putting in A player effort. But I have learned over a long enough period of time, if you have A player effort, you will get A player results. And to me... That period is three to four months. Okay. I have ne I've seen people struggle for two, three, or four months. Yep. I've never, ever seen someone put in the work every day and struggle for six months or an entire year. And that's where I have my rule. When I hire someone, every single person, you're on a 90-day trial. That's it. You're always going to be on a 90-day trial. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your background is. You're going to be on a 90-day trial. And I will not let up on that. And in that 90 days, we're going to most likely know. I would say there's about an 80% chance we're going to know if you're good or not or if you're going to stay through this thing long term. Yep. And that's how we make it. And at the beginning, I used to get a lot of people like, Zane, I'm putting in the effort, but I'm not getting results. Well, what happens? You dig into their day-to-day. -day. You dig into what they're doing. You dig into what their habits are. And there is always more to the story. I tell people, if I see someone that has the quote-unquote A-player effort with C-player results... I'm going to look into their life and guess what I'm going to find? I'm going to find this person has tons of open traffic tickets that like they don't pay. This person has tons of problems at home. This person always says that they show up on time, but they don't. This person, you know, says that they're going to be responsible for something that they don't. I'll give you a great example. I had one guy, he was really good. He put in tons of effort and he got no results. And three to four months into the company, I'm like, what is going on with this guy? He shows up, he's on time, he's sharp, he looks good. And we get a notice in the mail from the state that's basically like he's not paying his child support and he's extremely back and he's going through these lawsuits. And I'm like, bingo, there's always something. And it's not always easy to find. Sometimes it's really hard, especially if you're not close to those people. But you have to know a dud is a dud. At some point, dude, like if you put in the effort, you're going to get the results. I've never, ever met someone that truly, truly had the best diet went to the gym every single day, did all of the right things for three months straight and didn't get results. I've met plenty of people that said that they did it, but they know deep down, right? Are you calling me out right now? But, <laughs> but they know deep down that when it was midnight, they went and they were and they were eating the pistachios or they were eating the cake. It is me. Or they were eating the coke. <laughs> you know, like, like they know that. Now they might be doing 75 to 80% of what's right, but that 20% That's the of difference. what's wrong is what's holding them back. And I've learned in life, it's always that thing. There's always like, you could be doing 80% of the things right. You're doing the small 10 to 20% of the things wrong. That's going to stop all of your progress. It's so fucking I, true. I have something that's really important that I, because I, we've been friends for a long time. How important do you think it is to say no to things because you're on your vision? So let's just say, right, Zane has a shitload of followers, a lot of authority, a lot of influence. He probably has people calling him, dude, let's start a watch company. Let's start an exotic car company. Let's start a fucking cigar company. Like, all these crazy opportunities. How important do you think it is to say no to those? Yeah, I mean, listen, 
at the end of the day, I do my best to not say no because I know no is a very powerful word. Um, you always hear people say like, say no, say no, say no. I'm a big believer in either saying yes or saying not yet, but at some point. And the reason I've gotten like that is because I remember coming up and hearing no a million times. Now, of course, that made me right, but I always appreciate when people, uh, when people give you an opportunity or they give you a milestone or a goal. For example, if you wanna work with me, but I'm not ready to hire you yet because you have no experience, instead of being like, no, you're not hired, I'm gonna be like, listen, go door to door, sell solar for six months, get results, come back and show me that you got results and you got the job. I'm a big, big believer in that. So yeah, you know, listen, I get offered things millions of times, right? Like, like people always want to start this thing and that thing and that thing and that thing. And I never say no. I just let them know, listen, I got a lot on my plate. I got a million things going on and now is not the time. But if you can go out there and you can execute and you can show me a proven business model, we can do business together. Great example is my barber. He's one of the best barbers in Miami. Nice dude. Yeah, he's a nice dude. He's a very known guy. And I see him hustle, hustle, and hustle. So what did I say to him? I said, dude, you keep going and you keep doing your thing. You keep crushing it. I want to get into business with you at that point. And what did he do? He went and he took initiative. Instead of telling me, hey, Zane, we should start a business. We should do this. He went, he found a barbershop. He found a location. He found a place and he did the numbers and the math and then came and presented it to me. And I said, I would be happy to be your investor. Let's do the deal. That was the difference between him and someone else that's like, Zane, I just want to do business with you. Okay. So for me, it's like less about saying no or yes. It's about people have to realize and respect that you're so busy. And if they really want to get your attention, they got to go out there and they got to take the initiative because I don't have times to go onto LoopNet and find barber shops. I don't have times to go and study the industry. I have way too much going on in my plate to make it happen. But I do have resources. I do have capital and I do have people that I can plug into things. But I'm only going to do that if you come to me ready to go. Do not expect me to put in hours of research to get something done because I have so much going on. That's why whenever I have a new venture with someone, I have a new investment with someone, the first conversation I like to have is always I'm very transparent. I'm like, listen, I'm a busy motherfucker. I have a million things going on. Do not expect me to be an employee. Do not expect me to be like a full-time business partner. And do not expect me to be someone that's gonna be able to answer every single call at any point. But expect me to be someone that holds their weight and gets the job done. I will never ever make it a bad deal and I will never enter a deal where I'm not pulling my own weight. But I will never let someone make, you know, expect of me to go out there and put in all of this work when I don't have the time because the beauty of influence, the beauty of having some capital, the beauty of having some resources is you no longer have to go and do all of that. You right. have enough momentum going on to make things work a little faster. Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, that's pretty much how we did Marte yeah. in a way, you know? Yeah. No, it's true. And I know that you're really, you know, with your time is your most valuable, is one of your most valuable assets. I mean, he talks about it too, even when he's growing the business, like when he first started, he said, I know that time is my important asset. Yes, yeah, honestly, that was one of the the biggest lessons I learned from you when we were first, you know, starting to get into business is how good you were at delegating. I know we talked about that a little bit, but after we left that first event at, at Solar CEOs, yep. Before then, we never delegate. Like we didn't really delegate well at all. It's like, hard. To, like for good entrepreneurs, it's really hard to. I didn't even know what an well, SOP was. Well, other, I was like, I was like googling it when you, you guys want, were saying like SOP. Want to know the difference, Zany? It's because our parents' generation, right? Or roll the sleeves up, bang your head against the wall. If there's a problem, you're going to go do it. You're going to do it until you know, the wheels fall off. And that's kind of their momentum their entire lives. Yeah, exactly. Like our, our mentor was our father. Like He taught us everything we knew about business. But his, his level of business it was good. It was, like, it was a, a proven, true way to do it. And yep. he taught us a lot. But one of the things is like you got to do it yourself. Nobody can do it like you. You have to have your hands on everything. You have to be in the office. You have to be in the kitchen or wherever, you know, on the field. You need to be doing the sales. You need to be cooking everything. You like every, you got to be doing everything. So it was like an unlock when you, were, you, when you and your team were talking about that, like how you had everything dialed into an, yep. an SOP with KPIs on, on top of it. Since that, since that moment, everything in our lives have started to change. Like we've been able to scale everywhere much, much quicker and become way more efficient and, and, and less and, stressful and way less stressful and everybody around us is doing way better at the job than we were doing ourselves yeah you know and that was something that 
boom. Like I, you do. I don't know where you learn that, or just happen naturally, or you just figure it out as you trial. Went. I would say you know a little bit of studying, but mostly trial and error. It's like listen. I'm an efficient person and I hate doing things that I don't have to do. Right. I am the quickest delegator in everything I do. I am always looking for the cheat code. I'm always looking for the thing that is going to make it go a little bit faster. I'm never going to cheat the system necessarily, but I'm going to go for the cheat code, right? I'm going to go for the thing that I know is going to give me the best bang for my buck. And for me, like delegation has always been that thing in everything in my life. I value my time so much. From the beginning, I'm always like, listen, like now, you know, I have someone that cleans my house. Why? Because I'm an OCD person in the sense of I need all of my shit clean, but I absolutely hate cleaning. I hate picking <laughs> up the broom. I hate picking up the mop. You will not see me ever cleaning dishes, like ever, ever since I was a kid. Absolutely hated doing it. So what do I do? I'm going to go hire someone to do that. I hate cooking food, but I want to eat good food. I'm going to go and I'm going to hire a chef. I hate driving sometimes. So when I want to have a driver, I have a driver who's going to drive me. And I just became in that mentality of like, oh, I want a data person. I'm not smart at it. Let me find the data person. Oh, I want to build a software. I'm not smart at it. Let me find the best software person. And that just became my job. So now it's like I'm like an octopus with a bunch of tentacles. And it's like I have all of these people's doing these things. And my job, I have one core job. And that's to keep people focused on the greater mission. And as long as I can keep doing that, people will sort itself out. Like at the first, I was the top recruiter in the company, getting all of the leadership, getting all of the best talent. And then slowly over time, I still do it today at a high level. I taught my team how to do that. Now it's like, and confidently say, I could disappear for a year and my business isn't going to have an impact or an effect because I've turned my people into me. That's yeah. really important. Yeah, that's powerful. And we that, haven't got yeah. to that part yet. Like I think in our business stage, like that's probably our next big level is to really like make our leaders into like Lucho, into you, into myself. Yeah, where it's not like because we we always say like right, if we step away, we don't want to just maintain. We want to continue to grow, right. right? And for and for you, like to have other leaders that are pushing the company forward, not just like getting by for a month while you're away. You know, you want to know one secret. I don't think I've ever revealed this secret. All right, let's do it. A lot of people are very, very, very obsessed with short-term microeconomics. They're obsessed with today's numbers and they make their decisions based off today's numbers. And when you make micro decisions, you never get great macro results. Um, so whenever I've needed to hire someone, I'll tell you the biggest thing, even like when we haven't had the capital for a big hire, right? Like early on in the business, we're not doing that much revenue. And I bring on a, a hire that I'm going to be paying for like over 400 grand a year or two. So that's a lot of money at that time. What do I do? I realize that, listen, most people have been trained by the system, right? The so-called matrix. They think, oh, I'm going to go on Google. I'm going to type in the market rate for a job. And this is what I deserve to be paid. And that's the way most business owners pay their employees. They're like, oh, what does the average you know, installer make? What does the average person in finance make? What does the average person in software make? Cool. Let me go and either pay them below market and get a steal or pay them right at market. My philosophy has always been the complete different. I've always come up with income and compensation plans where like, listen, dude, I'm going to give you a great salary, but more importantly than that, I want you to make a million dollars in a year. And when you look at people's faces and you believe in them, that they have the ability and the potential to make a million dollars a year, their jaw drops and their face changes because they've never, ever had someone that's willing to do that. And I've always looked at it from, again, like a macro perspective. I'm like, listen... I can't afford to pay this guy a million dollars if I'm selling a hundred units, but if I'm selling a thousand units and this person keeps up the results and does the work, I have like paying someone a hundred grand at a hundred units is the same as paying that same person a million dollars at a thousand units. And if I can get them to have that output, we can do it. So when I see people, what I do my best is to create a compensation plan that don't, that doesn't only reward them for today, but shows them so much upward mobility that it keeps them locked in and engaged. And I would say one of my biggest secrets in starting on early on was I gave everyone a killer upward potential plan where they knew that they could do it and I was never ever greedy about it. And I'm constantly reminding them of what's possible. Because one of my flaws, honestly, is 
sometimes I get out of touch with reality, right? I forget that when I was a kid, my mom was looking at the price of milk and, and what it costs. I forget that my parents every single day were, you know, looking at the price of gas and, and what it is. I forget that my parents every single day were turning off the AC at a certain time and turning it on at a certain time and turning on lights and turning off lights and doing lighting the candle instead of the light. I forgot about that for a long time and I, I still do today. And sometimes I look at people and I'm like, holy crap, to you, $500 is the whole world. And to me, $500, I have so many transactions that leave my account every day that are sometimes five, ten thousand $10,000 and I don't even know about them. That's not because I'm unorganized or I don't have management, but it's just because I'm so focused on the big picture. I'm so focused on the big thing that I'm not getting caught up in the tiny details. And people obsess over the tiny details, which prevents them from ever being able to build something that's huge or have a long-term vision. And that was always just for me, like the focus. Like when I say billion dollar vision, I don't just say that blindly. I don't just say that as some like esoteric huge dream that I don't have a plan for. I have an exact game plan and I know exactly how I'm gonna do it. It's not a dream, it's a plan and I'm at a certain step of the plan and we're gonna get there. And I'm proud to say like, guaranteed, there is no doubt in my mind in 2024, we cracked the billion dollar you know, figure for the company um, and for the value of the company. I might get maybe close to around there. I think right about 30 years old is where I can personally cross a billion dollars in net worth. Now, most people, again, they look at that and they're like, that's crazy, that's intense. I could never ever do what you're doing. But you have to keep in mind, Five years ago, I'm sitting there with a small team on a couch saying that I'm gonna build a billion dollar company with no proof, with no track record, and no real plan in sights. I can attest for it. I literally remember the conversations and I was like, dude, billion dollars and you're sitting in LA and I was in Boston you know, doing nightlife stuff. I was like, this is insane. And it blows my mind until this day, right? I'll open up our banking app and I'll see, holy crap, last month we spent $23 million and it's like, holy crap. At one point in my life, I was worried about a $2.30 transaction, you know? And I think for me, it's always just been like, almost in a healthy way, losing touch of that short-term reality, yeah. not being obsessed with the small problems and focusing on obsessing on like the bigger problem. It kills momentum. When you focus on these small issues, like let's just say at the restaurant, right? Bringing it back to some of the stuff that we do. Like when you get so obsessed with one cook who did one thing or one night and one issue or one employee had one thing, it literally kills the momentum of where you're trying to go. It'll like suck your energy down so you can't even get above the weeds to keep the vision moving forward. Exactly. As long as you, you know, you can't ignore the details and not right. have the big vision. You right, have right. to, he's so up on the vision and, and right. all that, that those, with those plan, little, with a plan, with a plan the to get too. that done, those little things are just a distraction to get there. Right. You know, that's a, that's a huge, uh, huge lesson. Um, all right, so I mean, this was like ridiculous. Like, I'm like literally over here. I wish I had a pen and paper. Like, well, I'm gonna re rewatch this and take notes. This is like a mind blowing session here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, all right, so one question that we ask everyone, uh, you know, at the end is what's one piece of advice you would give to somebody? Um, you know, the best advice you can give to someone who either wants to start their own company or they're looking to become an entrepreneur. Like, what's one thing that could be the best? you know, unlock for them? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing before you do anything, right? Before you hire employees, before you even come up with your business plan is you gotta get this in check. You gotta get your mind in check. You gotta be ready to go. And for me, again, I was very lucky growing up. I had a massive amount of adversity. And most people use that adversity to go into a victimhood mentality of like, oh, the reason I can't do this is because I'm like this, or the reason I can't do this is because I grew up like this. You have to eliminate every excuse out of your life. I just spent uh, a, a trip. Uh, I can't mention too many details, like just due to NDAs, but it's gonna come out here in a few months online. But I just spent a, a four or five day trip um, in a part of the world uh, in, a, in a specific area where they don't have access to electricity, they don't have access to clean water, and they don't have access to refrigeration, food, Wi-Fi, any type of phone service or anything. I slept outside on a hammock. I got a uh, hundred different bug bites, uh, sleeping in hundred degree weather, sleeping with rain pouring on me and not having high quality food. 
and realizing that every person there was happy and grateful as anyone else here. They were smiling, they were running, they were ear to ear, just extremely happy. So what you have to do before you get into entrepreneurship is you have to realize you are gonna go through so much adversity and you have to get your mind prepared for that. You have to be ready to go and you have to be willing to tolerate any level of pain without caving in. If you are someone that very easily crawls under the blankets and you get scared and you get freaked out, you have to solve that. You have to figure that out because there is no way to be a successful entrepreneur and not be able to handle the type of pain that you have. So for me at an early age, before I did anything, it was about developing the mind. It was about being someone that was like, listen, I'll take a fucking bullet. I don't care. Like until this day, until today, I will take a shot to the arm. I will take a bullet for my company, for my team and for my people because I know that what's on the other side of adversity is always success. So when you're an entrepreneur who's coming up, the thing that usually stops people, it's not their, um, it's not their connections. It's not their money. It's not, you know, who their family is or what color they are or if they're male or they're female. These are all scapegoats for people. Sure, maybe if you're an African-American, people are gonna look at you a little bit differently. Maybe if you're a minority female in an industry with a lot of males, people aren't gonna believe in you as much. But that doesn't mean shit. At the end of the day, you have an opportunity. That's all you need. As long as I have a 1% chance, I'm freaking happy. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you have more money behind you. I don't care you know, who started you. I don't care who your mom and dad are. As long as you believe in yourself and you have that mentality, you're willing to be open-minded and you're willing to do whatever it takes, you are going to succeed. And I believe the number one reason that most people fail is they don't believe in themselves. They can't create that conviction. They crawl in when they have some problems or when someone talks shit. And the biggest thing is probably they get too arrogant. They think that just because they're this certain color or they're this certain race or someone else told them that they can't be successful, that they're not gonna do it and it's not their fault. They have like almost like this, this, this level of arrogance. Like, oh, the only reason I'm not this is because of this, but I'm still smart I and I'm still so. successful. For me, I never had that. I, had, I never had arrogance. I was willing to be open-minded. I was willing to accept that odds were stacked against me and I still had the ability to have opportunity. And listen, I can't say this for every single human being on planet Earth, truly, I can't. But I can say for 100% of the people in the United States of America, you have the opportunity to be whoever it is you want. I can probably say that for 50% of the world because there truly is a world out there where, listen, they still have a small, slim chance. Everyone does. But the odds are stacked up against them tenfold. And you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I don't have money. Oh, my parents are mean to me. Oh, people don't like me. Oh, people look at me funny because I'm a minority. That's an excuse, that's a cop out. You gotta believe in yourself, you gotta believe in your vision. And listen, if you have things stacked up against you, that is the number one asset that you can have in business. Because no one believed in me when I started, but I had my chin up. I wasn't gonna be accepted as you know the brown kid. I wasn't gonna be accepted as the minority. I wasn't gonna be accepted as the kid that grew up in a family with food stamps or the projects. I wasn't gonna be accepted as someone that was dumb or failed school. I didn't accept that. I never ever once accepted that. My thing was always, I will be successful and no one is ever gonna stop me. And whatever problem comes in my way, I'm gonna figure out how to solve that. And that's what like, man, if you can just figure out that one thing, I don't care what your IQ is. I don't care if you have money. I don't care where you come from. If you're just willing to give yourself that chance and not have that arrogance and willing to do whatever it takes, at some point, you will figure it out. For me, it was maybe a few years. For you, it might be 10 years. For this person, it might be 30 years. But eventually, with enough time put in, you will figure it out. And for most people, they just don't put in that time. They have that arrogance. They don't listen to, 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 to themselves and what their vision is. They listen to the people around them, and they put up their own blockers and their own limitations in life. And that's the biggest killer. Mic drop. Wow. <laughs> drop the mic. And that, my friend, why he's a billion-dollar man. But in the, in the U.S., though, how much do you see that here? I can't even listen to it sometimes when people give the excuse when no, I'm talking to them. No, once when you once hear it, as soon as you say, like, yeah, but my mom, or yeah, but my... It's, it's like, dude, what the fuck are you even talking about? 
yeah, you got to just remove it all. Like, and it's hard sometimes because we can get in our own heads. We can believe, you know, sometimes things that people say, but I've always found out every time someone has given me an opinion or an idea on why I can't succeed or why I can't make it happen. It's never, ever done anything for me ever. So, so true. So true. serve you for shit. All right. So this was uh, an incredible episode. Appreciate it. And, um, yeah, I could, we, we can go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, this was, this was amazing. Thank you for having us to your beautiful home. Where can you find him and stuff? Oh, yeah. So we can, f- yeah, tell everybody where they can find yeah, you. Yes, so you on can social. find me on Instagram at Zane Jan, Z A I N J J N. On Twitter, I believe it's Zane Jan Official. Um, and those are the two main places. And then on YouTube, you can just type in my name. I got a few videos up there, but we're going to be working on more content on YouTube, too. Awesome. All right, guys, make sure you give Zane a follow. And uh, thank you for, thanks for watching. Yeah, I appreciate you guys for having me. Thank yeah, you. Of course. Absolutely.